Hi everyone and welcome back. Before I get into this video, I want to address the teaser I made in the last episode about this case that I am going to use for the Relay computer. And first of all, thank you all so much for your great guesses in the comments. I do think the big giveaway here was this very particular shade of blue that shows through on the pixelated distorto vision thing going on here. But enough suspense. It's now time for the big reveal. This is a case for an Altair 8800. But to be clear, it's not an original case because who knows how much one of those is these days. This is a reproduction Altair case that I picked up from Adwater and Stir, and it's based on the drawings by Mike Douglas, or DRAMP as he's known in the Altair universe. Now I've had this case in mind for a long time. In fact, I actually used these case dimensions to come up with the maximum dimensions of my cards. Now my cards are a bit taller when compared to some of the Altair cards, but when I put everything in the case, it is thankfully a perfect fit. And a quick look inside confirms that we'll definitely need to create a more compact backplane so that everything will fit in this case. And for the front panel, I love the original Altair layout, but will likely customize it with some additional indicators and switches that are unique to the Relay computer, and I think that will be a lot of fun to design and build. But all of that is for another day, and today I want to switch gears and tackle something that has been a goal of mine since I started this project, and that is to create a more period correct program loader. I've been using an Arduino as a program loader during the build of this Relay computer, and it has been an awesome time saver. But I've always wanted to build something a little more period correct. The first thing that springs to mind is some form of punch tape storage. And this is actually the format that Conrad Zeus used on his Z3 Relay computer. And in this footage, courtesy of Curious Mark, we get to see the paper tape program loader in action on this Japanese relay computer that was built in 1958. A punch tape typically has an equally spaced set of smaller holes that are used to synchronize the reading of data from the tape. The tape is then punched with holes that are aligned vertically to the synchronization track that represent characters or data depending on the encoding being used. And for my relay computer, I would just use this simplified binary encoding that would then translate directly into the instructions or data to be loaded. So paper tape is clearly a proven option for this vintage of computer, but there's only one catch, and that is that I don't actually own a paper tape reader or a punch unit. And according to the prices on eBay, I'm not gonna be in the market for one of those anytime soon. Now one option would be to create a paper tape reader, and a great example is this amazing paper tape reader that David from Asagi Electric built from scratch. But even if I had those machining skills, which I do not possess, I would still be faced with the fact that I don't have a paper tape punch unit to create the tapes in the first place. So what's that saying, when a door closes and a window opens, or is it the other way around? I don't know. but Either way, I'm going to take another path here, and that is to pursue magnetic tape storage. And this type of storage was actually introduced as early as 1951 on the Univac. The Univac tape storage devices were branded as the Uniservo, and they had a tape format that consisted of eight tracks, of which six represented data, one was for parity, and one was called a sprocket track which is appropriately named since it's the same timing principle used on paper tapes. Now, I don't have an eight or nine track tape unit, but I do have my old cassette deck from the 80s still kicking around. And since this is a stereo unit, it has two separate tracks, which may not sound like nearly enough, but it's actually quite common in serial data communications. And for example, this was a similar protocol that I emulated for a USB keyboard interface on the TRS-80 Model 2. 
where a shift register builds a byte from the data and clock streams. So here's the plan. It's really building a twist on a shift register using a relay-based sequencer circuit and eight latch bits. So let's walk through how I think this is going to work. When the first clock pulse occurs, the sequencer would advance to the first step, which would then gate the result of the current data pulse to the first latch bit. And with the next clock pulse, the sequencer advances another step and gates that data pulse to the next latch bit. And if all goes well, it will happily continue to populate the remaining bits until we have a complete byte. And for now, we'll add this extra ninth step on the sequencer so we have a control signal to clear the latch bits for the next sequence. Now this all sounds good on digital paper, but let's start with the basics by first getting an audio signal to drive a relay. After literally just saying I want to reduce my dependency on the Arduino, I'm going to use it again, but just to generate the audio to be recorded. I'll use the tone function and set up a simple on-off cycle that outputs to pin 11. And then just a quick test by connecting the Arduino to a speaker and giving it some power. Now that we have something to record, it's time to get the tape deck set up. And I'm going to go ahead and connect both the inputs and outputs while I'm at the back end of this deck. And I can't remember the last time I cleaned the heads on this thing. It was probably back in the 80s, and it's long overdue for a good dose of isopropyl alcohol. And now that it's squeaky clean, it's time for that last connection, putting in a blank cassette, and recording our new clock audio signal. Now in order to get enough juice to drive a relay, I'm going to put this signal through this audio amplifier. I'll start by connecting these wires to the speaker outputs, which will be used to drive the relay clock circuit. And then just connect the tape deck output to these inputs. And once everything is connected and we start the tape, we can see that the VU meter on the amplifier is jumping in time to the recorded clock cycle. I'll use these handy banana plug and clip wires to hook up a meter to the speaker output. And then while watching the meter, I can use the volume control to dial in around five volts or so. And when I hook up the amplifier speaker outputs to an LED, it actually shows our recorded audio clock signal coming through loud and clear. So that's awesome. But when I hook up a relay, well, Things go a bit off kilter, and I put a mic close so you can get the full effect. And when we take a closer look back at the meter, we can see why. Audio amplifiers output audio in AC, or alternating current. Alternating current is cycling between plus 5 and minus 5 volts at 60 Hz whereas the relay requires DC or direct current that maintains a constant voltage during the same time period in order to properly engage. So what we need is something that can convert the alternating current from the amplifier to direct current that can effectively drive the relays. And this finally gives me a reason to build a full bridge rectifier. Now I'm not going to go into details on how these work because this video from Electroboom explains it all in a much more entertaining way. The voltages are less, but the principle is the same. It's just a matter of building our new rectifier on the breadboard. We'll start with the four diodes, bridging at both ends, and then add a capacitor to smooth things out. And finally, we can add our relay, indicator LED, and a resistor, and then cross our fingers for this next test.
Now that we're able to drive a relay from our recorded audio clock pulses, this means that we have the clock signal that can drive a sequencer. And that brings us to this massive jumble of wires, which is a nine step sequencer circuit. And we do have a sequencer in the relay computer already, but it's dedicated to fetching and executing instructions in the computer. So really it's just too busy doing other things. Plus, I'll need access to the outputs from each step to gate the data values to the latch bits later on. So a quick walkthrough of this board, starting with the sequencer, which consists of these four rows here. And then tucked in here are some LEDs that we'll see lighting up in a minute. And over here, we have these top three relays that divide the incoming clock signals into the pulses needed to drive the various steps within the sequencer. And I've added this handy push button here so we can engage the clock manually. And then below that, we have a hard reset, which really just momentarily interrupts the power and recycles the entire board. And then below that, we have what I'll call a soft reset or a primer that engages the first stage of the sequencer and gets it ready to go. And we can give this a quick whirl by doing a reset, priming the sequencer, and then just engaging the clock manually through all of the steps. And that would have been the first eight bits of our byte that we would want to latch. And then we have our ninth step, and we're going to use that as a control signal to clear the latch bits later on. But for now, we know the sequencer is doing its thing, and I think we're ready to hook up our clock that is driven by the audio pulses from the cassette tape. And we'll push play on the cassette deck, and once the tape gets past the leader, we should see some action on the sequencer. All right, this is awesome. I'm just going to mute the beeping by disconnecting the speaker. I think you can still hear me over the awesome clicking that's going on here. There we have it. We have an actual relay-based clock and sequencer being driven by an audio signal recorded on a standard cassette. So this is really, really amazing. So for me, this is uncharted territory. There's no design that I'm basing this on. It's really the definition of homebrew. So I'm pretty amazed and maybe even a little bit surprised that things are working as well as they are so far. So all in, I'm pretty happy with the results. And now that we have the sequencer done, we can work on writing the data track to tape and then using the sequencer to actually pull that data into the latch bits. And undoubtedly, there's going to be some odds and ends that crop up on this project. You know, Murphy's Law is going to kick in. And to me, at least, that's all part of the fun. But let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, any theories that you have, any suggestions, that would be greatly appreciated. And with that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.